use this as incentive to study that much harder for the ACS exam, right? <laughs> All right, we get to change gears. We were going over aldehydes and ketones. Now we're going to go into a different class of carbonyls, the carboxylic acids. Before we dive into chemistry, I want to go through naming. So let's do an example problem and then we'll talk about variations of this. Let's take a look at this carboxylic acid. First step whenever we're naming an organic compound is to identify the longest organic chain of carbons, right? So let's go through and number it. Are we going to number left to right or right to left? Right to left. You want the priorities to be at the lowest, or your highest priority to be at the lowest position. This is chapter 21. All right, so we've got a hexane derivative. So if we go to name this, it's going to start with hexane. And then anytime you're naming a carboxylic acid, you have an oic acid. So this differentiates it from a regular hexane. It's hexanoic acid. There's one slight problem with carboxylic acid naming. There's a lot of non-standard IUPAC names that are allowed. So I want to quickly go through those because you'll see them pretty regularly in the book. And we'll see if you guys can come up with the names of any of these without me telling you. Does anybody know what the name of this would be? Formic acid, right? We've got that formate group coming off there. So this is formic acid. When I was a kid, I remember going around in the yard and um, squeezing ants because apparently I was an awful kid. Um, <laughs> And if, <laughs> if you do that, you can actually smell your hands and they smell awful. Ants use formic acid um, in their whatever. <laughs> but it's very, very pungent and stinky. So if you ever do squash, squish an insect and you smell that really astringent smell, it's usually formic acid. The next one, sorry, I'm not up to date on my biology with insects. The next one is this one where we've got a CH3 group on there. What's this called? Acetic acid. acid, also known as vinegar. So acetic acid's pretty common. Do all carboxylic acids stink? A lot of them do. You're getting to my next point, actually. <laughs> the next one sounds a lot like its IUPAC name. It's propionoic acid. And I think they just named it this because it sounds weird to say propioic acid. So propionoic acid flows a little bit better. The next one is closely related. It's got one extra carbon on there. This is called butyric acid. Has anybody watched the show Whale Wars? No, it was kind of a short-lived fad, but it was about um, they weren't Greenpeace, it was another group, but they were protesting whaling in the Antarctic region. And so what they do is they go up to these Japanese research vessels and they throw these bottles at them. And the bottles were full of butyric acid. It is incredibly pungent, like it is enough to clear a room. And so their strategy was if we nail their ship with this enough, they won't come outside and do any whaling. So yeah, these are pretty stinky. <laughs> the next one. You guys know this already. Quick quiz. Benzoic acid. Benzoic acid's not stinky. A lot of you guys made it already. Uh, these aromatic compounds or the higher molecular weight carboxylic acids are so heavy and so non-volatile that you oftentimes can't even smell them. Oops. The next one.
looks similar, but instead of it being a benzene ring, we've got a cyclohexane ring. So we just call this cyclohexane carboxylic acid. Yeah, so these are the non-standard names for regular carboxylic acid derivatives. The other acids I wanted to get into are important in a lot of biochemistry reactions. These are the di acids. And they follow a completely different naming system than with conventional carboxylic acids. Yeah, because nothing's easy. So the first one is two carboxylic acids adjacent to one another. This is called oxalic acid. The next one has one extra carbon. This is called malonic acid. The next one has one extra carbon in. You can see where this trend is going. This is called succinic acid. And then as we continue adding on carbons, we'll run into glutaric acid. And then hopefully you guys remember this one. What's this one called? Adipic acid. Adipic acid. You guys made this. This was the product we made when we cleaved open cyclohexene. And then last but not least, we've got pimelaic acid. You may be wondering, how am I supposed to remember these? At least that's what I remember thinking when I was taught these. But have no fear. I have an excellent acronym for you guys. Are you ready for this? <laughs> All right, we've got oxalic, malonic, succinic, glutaric, adipic, and pimelaic uh, acid. And so the acronym I use is oh my comma, such good apple pie. <laughs> this got me through grad school. <laughs> All right? <laughs> so if you're forgetting how to name your dye acids, remember, oh my, such good apple pie. That'll get you the name, more or less. <laughs> At least the first letter of the name. All right, I think that's more or less where we're going to stop with naming today. We're going to go back and we're going to talk about how to name carboxylic acid derivatives. Um, they all have different naming schemes, but um, don't overcomplicate things. Just try to use the oic acid suffix anytime you're dealing with the carboxylic acid, with the exception of these kind of oddball names. Carboxylic acids are pretty unique functional groups, so let's talk a little bit about their structure and property. Oops. The cool thing with carboxylic acids is if you put them in solution, they actually tend to form dimers. And most of you guys have seen this in IR without even realizing it, right? So if you've got one carboxylic acid group next to another one, let's say they're paired up like this, what do you think will happen? Hydrogen bond to one another. So it's pretty common that you see these OH groups broaden out on IR. You guys saw that with the hairy beards um, in the um, benzoic acids 
or benzoic acid derivatives that you made in lab. You also see it in IR too. You see the peak tend to broaden out quite a bit. Where do carboxylic acid peaks show up on proton NMR? Does anybody remember? Like 3600. You're thinking of IR. Yeah, right around 12 to 13 ppm, and they tend to be kind of broad humps in that region because of this dimerization that occurs. The other unique thing with carboxylic acids is that obviously they're acidic. The pKa range can be quite wide, though. It can be all the way from about 0 to 5. So we're talking about a huge range of acidity. So if you're thinking about something like trifluoroacetic acid, it has a pKa close to zero, but regular acetic acid has a pKa of five. The range for carboxylic acid depends a lot on resonance and induction. So remember, it's affected by resonance and induction. So it doesn't have a very reliable pKa range. Just be aware of um, what it's attached to. Uh, carboxylic acids do a lot of really unique chemistry, and so we're going to spend a big chunk of the ch chapter talking about new types of reactions. But before we do that, let's talk about some of the old uh, preparation methods we have. Is it OK if I move on? So let's do a little bit of review. Let's say I have a primary alcohol and I want to convert this into a carboxylic acid. How can I do it? Chromic acid. So Na2Cr2O7, sulfuric acid, and water will go or we'll take you from a primary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid. If you're rusty on any of these, make sure you go back and review. This was from section 10.9. Okay, next one. Let's say I've got toluene and I want to convert toluene into benzoic acid. What reagents do I need? more chromic acid. <laughs> Alternatively, let's just change it up for, for fun. You can use potassium permanganate, sodium hydroxide, water, and heat. This is actually the preferred route. And quench it with acid in order to isolate your carboxylic acid. Does anybody know why potassium permanganate is preferred over chromic acid for this reaction? Yeah, it's cancer dust, right? So we want to avoid using cancer dust if possible. Um, potassium permanganate is a lot less harmful, although the byproducts are still hazardous to dispose of. Is that heat mixed in water? Yeah, that's a triangle symbol for heat. And this was from section 18.6. Chromic acid is pretty nasty stuff, and chemists are more and more trying to get away from its use. All right, let's do another review question. Let's say I've got an alkyne, and I want to convert this alkyne into carboxylic acid. What was that? Ozonolysis. So remember, with ozonolysis, we first bubble in ozone gas. And then what do we need for the second step for alkynes? Water. You actually don't need a, a strong reducing agent. Alkynes are very, very susceptible to cleavage. And there you go. This was review from section 10.9, so last term. All right, the next one. We can have a nitrile, and we can hydrolyze this all the way to the acid. And what do we need to do this? Not quite. 
This was from the cyanohydrin portion of last chapter. We said we can make a cyanohydrin and then convert that nitrile to a carboxylic acid. Does anybody remember what reagents we need? Acid and heat. Acid and heat, exactly. And you're going to do this mechanism on your pod, um, but it's very, very similar to all the mechanisms we saw last term. So it's going to involve a lot of proton transfers, nucleophilic attacks, kicking off a leaving group, things like that. All right, the last one is let's say we have benzaldehyde. And I want to convert benzaldehyde into benzoic acid. How can we do that? Peroxy acid. Do you remember the name of that reaction? <laughs> Close enough. Uh, Bayer Villiger oxidation, right? So we can use a peroxy acid, so RCO3. H, and if you remember, that hydrogen is really likely to do a shift over onto that oxygen. So we have to remember the priorities for alkyl migrations or hydrogen migration. In this case, it's a really nice way to form uh, carboxylic acid. All right, there's one new method that we're going to cover. It's a pretty simple method. You guys will like it because mechanistically it's not complicated. This method involves use of a Grignard reagent. The first step that you do is you take dry ice, you can buy it from Fred Meyer or wherever, toss it in your reaction flask, get it bubbling, let it continue to bubble until all of your Grignard's quenched and gone. Then when you're done, you treat it with acid, and all of a sudden you've got a brand new carboxylic acid. So let's try to rationalize what's going on in this mechanism. So we've got this Grignard and we've got CO2. And if you remember, the Grignard reagent that we have has this super polarized bond Oops. where all of the electron density is getting sucked over to that carbon. So this carbon is going to be a really good nucleophile. And we can think of carbon dioxide, in this case, acting as an electrophile. So the carbon can attack the carbon and the carb or the carbon on the dry ice can kick up electrons onto this oxygen. And you end up with this salt. Pretty straightforward. And then last step, we're gonna treat this with acid in order to get our neutral carboxylic acid salt, or neutral carboxylic acid instead of the salt. Can you kind of think of CO2 as like a cleaner like a double aldehyde ketone the way it is, if you look at the structure, it's kind of the same thing that happens with the normal attack on aldehyde ketone. Yeah, that's a good question. It's pretty hard to do a nucleophilic attack on CO2, it's not a great electrophile. It's very, very stable, which is a part of the problem with global warming, obviously, is people have tried and tried and tried to figure out how can we convert CO2 into a useful molecule. It's not very practical to use Grignard reagents to do that, though, unfortunately. This is one of the only reactions where you see CO2 used, at least in the Klein textbook. Make sense? All right. Let's continue on. I think we've got 10 more minutes, and we'll talk a little bit about reactions of carboxylic acids. And one of these is a review reaction, but we didn't really cover the mechanism. I kind of glossed over it, and we hand-waved our way out of it.
it was this reaction where we take a carboxylic acid and we reduce it to a primary alcohol. We covered this last term when we were going over alcohol chemistry. What reagents do we need? Yeah, lithium aluminum hydride followed by weak acid in order to reprotonate that alcohol. Let's actually take a look at the mechanism now because it's more involved than the mechanism uh, we saw last term. Actually, let me draw this out as an actual bond. And the first step It's pretty straightforward. We know that lithium aluminum hydride is a really nice source of H minus. H minus we can think of as a nucleophile, but we can also sort of think of it as what? H minus hydride. It's a good nucleophile, but also strong base, right? We've got a carboxylic acid, we've got a strong base. Fastest reaction in chemistry is going to be a proton transfer. So this hydride will immediately deprotonate our carboxylic acid and will bubble some H2 gas off. Okay, now that we've done that, we need another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride. Or we can actually use the byproduct in this case. And one of these hydrides will actually, oops, attack the carbonyl, and then the strange thing that happens is we'll kick up electrons and the lone pair from this oxygen will coordinate with the aluminum. So you actually get this cyclic mechanism. Now that we've got this, this is actually a decent leaving group. So now that we've formed a decent leaving group, we can kick it off. And we can reform a new CO double bond. However, this time it's at an aldehyde. Why do you think it's hard to stop at the aldehyde? Yeah, it can happen again, right? Lithium aluminum hydride is a really, really strong reducing agent. So if we have another equivalent of lithium aluminum hydride around, we can have attack by one of these hydrides pick up electrons onto that oxygen. And then last but not least, we treat this with weak acid in order to protonate our alkoxide. It's really, really hard to stop at the aldehyde. We have to come up with some clever techniques if we want to stop at the aldehyde, and we'll cover those later. There's actually one other technique that's oftentimes preferred over lithium aluminum hydride, and I'll show you guys why. So let's say we've got this generic carboxylic acid and I want to go to my primary alcohol. I can actually treat it with a reagent that looks pretty familiar. This boring THF complex. Actually move this arrow down. We're not going to go through the mechanism for this. 
because it's not clearly laid out in our book, and to be perfectly honest, it's not very well understood, but it's an excellent way of reducing carboxylic acids. Question is, why do we need a new technique? I'll show you. Let's say we've got this compound. where we have both a ketone and a carboxylic acid on the same molecule. But all I want to do is reduce the carboxylic acid. I can treat this with BH3 THF. And I can reduce this carboxylic acid all the way down to a primary alcohol without touching the ketone at all. It gets more into the mechanism that is kind of beyond the scope of the course, so we're not going to get into that. The, the biggest thing to remember is that the boring THF complex is exclusively going to reduce your carboxylic acid. It won't touch other functional groups, which is nice if you're looking to selectively make reductions in your compound. So, not reduced. Let's make a little note. Yeah, exactly. And this will become pretty useful when we get into some new types of synthesis problems where we can, let's say, convert a toluene derivative to a carboxylic acid and then selectively reduce that to an alcohol without touching any of the other carbonyl groups on a molecule, right? So it's a pretty powerful tool. So that won't touch the aldehyde either, right? Nope, it won't touch aldehydes or ketones, which makes it pretty nice. All right, I think that's where we're going to end off today. Um, if you do have questions about the exam, you're more than welcome to come talk to me.